Hey everybody, welcome back to the Look It All podcast. This is your host, Elias Roush. This podcast is sponsored by EliasRoushMedia.com. Photo, video, digital media production. Today we are discussing The Outsider, Season 1, Episode 2. What the hell is this shit called again? Um, Roanoke. Which was an oddly specific uh, callback to the people that were lost in North Carolina. I think about 200 people were lost in Roanoke, just up and left, or disappeared, or something happened, we don't know. But anyways, here's the synopsis. Ralph admits to being baffled by conflicting physical evidence. An unexpected tragedy throws the investigation into a tailspin. Glory tries to soothe her daughter, Jessa, who says there's been a strange man in her room at night so a couple of the predictions that we discussed in the first episode one i discussed the brother of the grieving family the victim's family he ended up uh going off and he shot terry and i kind of was when I first watched it I first watched it the first half of this episode and then I came back and rewatched the entire thing and I was like holy shit we lost Terry Kelly was the one that was like yep he did I was like oh fuck so I was not expecting to lose Jason Bateman's character the second episode which I did they do that so he could you know direct more episodes or is that part of the plot? I don't know. This episode was told in sequential order, as in like it wasn't all jum- jumbled up and whatnot. Uh, the family of the grieving uh, victim has lost the su- the original son that was killed in episode one. The mother had a heart attack, and then the brother ends up going ape shit and trying to kill Terry and gets himself killed which leads us to the father of the family who which he decides he does not want to be on this earth any longer so he tries to hang himself in his bedroom and a jogger outside happens to see him um, his body as it flies kind of out of the window as well um, when he's being hung but he may or may not make it. So that family is completely fucked. Um, so no really happy ending for them. One thing I noticed about this uh, last two episodes is I'm not crazy about the kids um, that are kind of just, uh, I think it's Terry's kids that are seeing some strange man. I don't know, just feels kind of artificial or I'm not really sure what to think about it or too on the nose I don't know just doesn't I'm not I'm not buying it so uh and and I think we see what like muddy feet on the sorry muddy shoe prints on the uh on the floor which indicate he's probably in there but I don't know what his motivation is I'm I'm kind of iffy about this uh quote-unquote guy that's running around and we're seeing weird i'm assuming it's the guy in the uh in the hood that we get to see like i think he was standing outside of the victim's house when the father tried to hang himself and we see this really long shot of him still don't know what he looks like so that's about all i wrote down for this episode it was kind of a more uh character based episode and not so plot centric especially when terry dies so i have no idea where this uh this is you know unfolding to i, it, I did not see ralph ending up on terry's wife's uh front porch asking for her help but maybe that's where maybe that's where we're going but uh, uh i am curious if they're going to be able to sustain 10 episodes Of this because it feels almost too obvious that there's a guy out there that's sort of framed Terry in my opinion now I have not seen any other episodes 
yet, but my guess is, yeah, he's being framed. How does this series end? Hmm. Uh, I would have said that it has something to do with him self-reflecting about his... I think we find out Ralph has a daughter that was on a... Or, sorry, sorry, had a, had a, had a kid that was... On the baseball team that Terry used to coach, and he was not that... Sorry, I, I said he had a daughter. I think he had a son. Um, Terry used to coach him and teach him how to bunt because he couldn't swing the ball apparently too well. I, I, I'm, I'm guessing he has some sort of muscular dystrophy or some sort of disease that prevented him from, um, you know, doing it exactly what you know being quote-unquote normal uh but it looks like terry was uh you know cared about ralph's um child so that was kind of a sweet scene to see so um i am curious to see how they're going to wrap up this season all right everyone thank you for watching thank you for listening Lug it out podcast whatever you're doing Thank you for supporting. Check out the rest of the Luggedog podcast on SoundCloud, Apple iTunes, Google, whatever you like to use. We're on there. Twitch, YouTube. Email, Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, Instagram, YouTube, Discord. Links all down below. Support the podcast with paypal.me slash the Lucky Dog podcast. Thank you for listening. And take it easy. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Lucky Doll Podcast. This is your host, Elias Roush. This podcast is sponsored by EliasRoushMedia.com, photo, video, digital media production. Today we're discussing The Outsider, Season 1, Episode 3. So, I uh, did just want to cover a few quick notes on there. I realize this show is coming out week to week at the, t- at the time we're recording this, and I believe there's about six episodes available right now, so... Uh, kind of taking my time a little bit releasing the podcast, mostly because there is the week-to-week format. So, season three of this uh, season is uh, called Dark Uncle. And I'm trying to think of what that would correlate. I might have to, you know, look in the comments or look at some other podcasts. I'm not doing any other uh, research into the show outside of just watching it and recording notes. Uh, but, uh, overall I'm really digging the intros. The unpredictability of this show is, uh, it's pretty nice. It does give me that night of feel when it comes to, if anyone saw the night of, uh, it goes a lot on to showing how the process of, solving a crime is done and I, I really enjoy that uh, so I'm liking the intros as well the intros of how they're bringing in the 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 title um, and then fading it into the sequence of whatever's playing so uh, the beginning of this deputy deputy asshole gets what I thought was burned on the back of his head while he was at the barn, but it was really hard to tell exactly what's going on. The deputy has to go to investigate at the barn where the clothes of Terry Maitland, um, Terry Maitland's clothes were found, and he is just not wanting to go. I mean, he's going to the strip club, big chilling, not feeling. He does not want to go to this crime scene, but when he shows up, he gets his ass toe up. When he's at the barn, uh, I thought they'd do a good job of, you know, bringing this creepy-ass atmosphere. Looks like there's, like, a graveyard right outside of the uh, the farm that they pull out to see a wide shot of. He's inside, squealing with these mouses. I've never heard a mouse, like, straight up, just like, <laughs> like straight up, this geek is out. And... Um, let me see, Terry Maitland, sorry, not Terry, Terry uh, Deputy Asshole, I, I don't know this guy's name, but I just keep calling him that, um, 
he apparently sees a sh- like some sort of shadow or something. He sees somebody in the barn, and he starts talking to him, saying, "I'm a police officer. You can't do this. Don't don't hurt me," kind of thing. And it's hard to tell exactly what happens to the back of Deputy Asshole's head. He looks like he gets burned when he shows back up in the next scene after leaving the barn. He goes to what appears as his apartment or house or whatever, and uh, you see the back of his head, and it looks like he was like struck in the back of the head, but maybe possibly burned, and so he's trying to you know do whatever. And we see him later in the episode. And he's acting just like an absolute buffoon again in the strip club. But he's also saying, you know, know, stop whatever's happening. And you kind of see things on the back of his head that look like some sort of infection or... I don't know, something's taking over. And it's hard to tell exactly how that correlates to this. What sounds like we have like some sort of shape-shifting guy. So, uh, let me see... We see early scenes of Ralph having somewhat of a PTSD of the shooting once he's looking at clips and whatnot of it and talking to his therapist. It doesn't seem like, I don't know if he's not coping well, but he just seems like he's in a a really tough spot, especially with the loss of his uh, child. They definitely found some sort of like Slimer jizz, like Ghostbusters, Green, like, slimy shit all over the jeans and all over the clothes of Terry Maitland and so I wonder if that has some sort of correlation to with how the how the shapeshifter changes or something what it leaves behind Um, also there's prints of older Terry like an older version of Terry Maitland I don't know on the belt buckle I believe they say which I'm not really sure why that correlates I guess they have to the, the differ between the the prince of young Terry Maitland versus old Terry Maitland but why would the shapeshifter decide to be like a 95 year old version or he maybe he didn't know that you know his fingerprints weren't identical which is kind of crazy um let's see Oh yeah, I love the outside shot of Ralph and Howie uh, talking. Well, it's it's actually the detectives and Howie and uh, everybody, but it kind of does a slow zoom from the outside, and the way that it it's uh, kind of just creeping in on their conversation. It's very cool, very cool. It's almost like we're the perspective of that shapeshifter thing. That'd be kind of crazy. Insert Cynthia Erivo. We all remember Miss Erivo from, well, she's very well known in Broadway, but she's also very well known on the big screen in The Bad Times of El Royale. I love this actress. She's a very talented actress when it comes to, well, I think she recently just played Harriet Tubman, which was, I didn't see the movie, but I heard it was okay. She did a lot better than the actual movie was, but she's always glowing in everything she's in. Bad Times at El Royale, she had to really carry a lot of that movie on her back, and she did it with, you know, style, she did it with amazing choreography, she did it with, she she can do the action, she can do the acting, she can do the dramatic stuff, she can sing, she's a very talented actress, and she's gorgeous on top of that, so... She's got the full package going on, so I'm very happy to see her getting uh, some HBO work as well. So, they give this character, uh, sorry, I don't even have the character's name up, um, Holly Gibney, a very interesting background, and I actually like how in-depth they go with the background of this character, of Holly, um, it starts off slow by, you know, saying maybe she has some weird proclivities and weird things about her that make her interesting. Like, she doesn't like to fly. She doesn't like heights. She needs to sit in a special seat at the bar. And she knows random stuff. Like, 
you know, when is May 5th and 40 years or something like that. It's just like, you know, what day does it fall on? Just ran, just random shit. Uh, she's, she's almost, uh, like a Slavon, is it called a Slavon or something like that? Where you, they're like super smart, not quite all the way there socially, but like have like super amazing, uh, abilities to just know random things and sometimes never forget. Like it's like, I, I don't know if it's a combination of all of those things or what, but, uh, I'm glad that they didn't just make her the random quote unquote magical person of color. Cause that tends to happen a lot in, uh, Stephen King, uh, novels and just, uh, horror and you know just theatrical stuff in general I mean bring the person of color in and think of like The Shining or something like that uh let's see we have more therapist scenes I thought it was the thing about this uh series is they find ways like the therapist scene to make it interesting by shooting it in interesting ways like the camera will be set up behind uh, the stairwell looking in on Ralph and the therapist on their conversation. Now, there's a hundred different ways they could have shot that, but I thought that was one of the most interesting when it comes to still seeing his his depression. You could, even though we're watching the majority of the side to the back of his head, we can still see he's he's laying low and sagging it like it's he he's not making full contact with the therapist until half you know part way through the the conversation and then the camera turns to uh the just showing focusing on the back of Ralph's head and keeping the therapist out of focus a little bit to the right of the screen which is still very interesting kind of reminds me of a little bit of a uh, Tarantino in the way that he would shoot the back of people's heads and have some interesting uh, camera work. I think the camera work and cinematography in this has been uh, quite impressive. So, uh, let's see. This is this therapist scene. We also hear about uh, you know how he was coping with the loss, I believe, of his son, and uh, we get the scene of him back in the bar fighting and I think this fighting shot is kind of weird I don't know if it's because it's kind of talked about in a way of like a dream but uh Kelly knows it as well and she said that it looked like that they had shot it either on green screen like when they they're shooting it practically in front of the bar when they're showing when they're pu pushing in on the glass and maybe somehow that's talking about his alcohol addiction away in a way. There's a lot of shots about hands and uh, glasses and stuff like that in this episode. But uh, it's pushing in on the uh, the glass. And then uh, Ben Mendelsohn comes around the bar and he joins that fight that's going on. And it looks like it's shot in like a different frame or something, a different speed. Or almost like there was a green screen behind the bar. And then he comes back and drinks the rest of the... I mean, after he whoops those guys' asses, and then he go, he comes around and gets the rest of his drink. But I guess it's just showing that he's been kind of an angry guy all uh, for a long time. Because it looks like he has no correlation to those guys. I don't even know. Um, Let's see. Mm -hmm. We also get this side story of this this guy in jail. I'm still trying to figure out exactly what's going on. I didn't I didn't go through the wiki uh, plot or anything like that, so I might need to go look. But this guy's apparently a, an accused child killer, possibly killed the two young girls, and he's getting mail that is threatening him. And so it's he's decided to break his glasses, turn it into some sort of. Uh, sharp shiv or something i don't know how to exactly i i don't, I don't know it's not a shiv it's a, a i don't know a, just a piece of glass that he sharpens up and ends up instead of uh letting these guys come kill him he ends up taking his own life but the way that is shot it's like holy shit it's just scary as fuck just the way the 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 pol not the police but the the guards are just opening 
the different cells and you just watch these doors open and you think about it like those doors are not very useful if they aren't locked in, in that scenario so it's like I thought he was going to go out battling but he ends up taking his own life so I'm still kind of confused about the relevancy between that guy and uh, Holly's character maybe they're related in a way but still in a way it didn't make 100% sense but the way they were editing between it they have some sort of uh, relation let's see Yeah, I love the backstory of uh, Holly's character talking about the white coats and that her parents wanted to, to quote unquote, fix her, save her, you know, whatever they wanted to figure out. Um, but really, nothing was wrong with her. Maybe just the. I don't even know what, what it would be called. Um, there's one scene when before the guy's killed in jail that there's uh, the guy that's going to kill him. Uh, I think he pulls uh, a sh like, a, like a kitchen knife, or not a kitchen knife, but uh, some sort of plastic knife from his leg. And oh my god, that was hard to watch with the uh, the body horror. Jessa, oh my gosh, still on her bullshit. Let me let me just tell you that Jessa claims to tell everyone that this blurry man. We're, I guess we'll just call him the blurry man. Uh, showed up at her place four times. The first time looking like Terry. Second time, he was trying to make her cry. Third time, and, and she's reciting this all to, uh, to uh, Ralph's wife at this point. And the third time, he shows up looking blurry. Which explains why his face hasn't really looked the same since we've seen him. And I don't really recall if we got to see him in this episode at all. Uh, outside of it being out of focus, maybe. And then the fourth time, she says that he showed up muscly and inky. Uh, so, maybe he's taken on the form of the new deputy asshole. Um, I'm trying to figure out exactly if he's taking the form of these people or if he's taking control of the people. I got questions. And I was talking to Benz, my, uh, another buddy of mine who's been on the podcast before. He was on a Mission Impossible Fallout podcast back in the day. Uh, I can't think of anything else he's been on recently. Uh, oh, the hip-hop one. Uh, I forgot what it was called. But anyways, uh, Benz and I were talking like... The way they took out Terry Maitland seemed so unceremoniously. The, they had uh, they had him talking. The way they they did like the slow mo. They did the action scene, the action scene, and then they did the action scene again in slow mo. And the way they did it slow mo made it seem a little bit more dramatized, as if we we're gonna see something else that we didn't expect to see. Uh, let me think. Oh, maybe he's going to see that get, that guy there, the blurry guy, at, at the uh, the shooting. Because I'm pretty sure he was at the shooting. But uh, let me think. So anyways, the, the way they took out Terry's uh, character did make it seem like he was going to live. And the way the rest of the episode played out was no one was talking about Terry except for the doctor and his, uh, his wife saying sorry for your loss and I was just like wait what they they didn't even show Terry like really dying I mean he was dying but we didn't like see a body or anything like that I was expecting so much more a funeral uh, just I don't know I, I felt like it was just kind of swept away it's like okay on with the case so anyways that's about all I got for this episode. Um, let me see. Uh, I'm assuming the blurry guy is now taking on the form of the muscly asshole. Muscly asshole. Sorry, I'm saying muscly. <laughs> uh, and he's trying to make Jessa angry for some reason. And I remember Jessa says, like, y'all are the ones that are supposed to be scared. This guy almost reminds me of like the boogeyman or something. I, I, I don't, even, I'm not exactly sure what to compare him to. I want to know what his, uh, why he wants to do this, why he's terrorizing these people. So the um, creepy mall security guy 
talking to Cynthia, uh, or sorry, Holly. That guy was kind of weird. I remember him from uh, House Cards. Mainland's father, Terry Mainland's father, was in, was interviewed, I guess, swarmed by the police and, sorry, not the police, the detectives and reporters and whatever, uh, way when Terry was already uh, brought in. And I guess they don't have the news that Terry was taken out. I, I'm, I guess I'm kind of confused uh, how long the timeline has been since the original killing. Is it a week? A month? I'm, I'm kind of confused. Um, I liked the rapport between uh, Holly and Ralph's character when she said it's good to hear someone that's on her side. Sounds like she just needs someone to talk to sometimes. And uh, yeah, we talked about what happened in the jail and then I wonder how that's going to affect uh, the rest of the the detective work or whatever I, I, I'm, I'm kind of unclear how that has anything to do with anything and uh, asshole J uh, detective deputy asshole is uh, probably the blurry guy in some sort of manner we got to figure out exactly what what that means though. is he taking over the form of him or like when he was getting like whip lashed in the you know pistol whipped in the back of the uh Barn. It was. It was kind of hard to see exactly what was happening to him. But I've watched it twice, and it still looks like he was just burned. So, I got questions. So many questions. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Lucky Dog Podcast. We cannot do this without you. If you have comments, questions, concerns, you know what to do. Lucky Dog Podcast. Gmail dot com. What do we have? Email the Lucky Dog Podcast at gmail dot com. Twitter Lucky Dog Podcast. Facebook group link is down below twitch link is in the description so is the instagram youtube and discord link join the discord we would love to have you in the chat talk to everybody talk to everybody that likes to talk about movies talk about tv talk about bullshit talk about whatever's going on the blurry man whoever who knows uh but the oscars are coming down might have a little discussion about that in the aftercast be sure to check out the Aftercast number four. Aftercast number five will come in down soon. The Aftercast just discusses a little bit of behind the scenes and non-movie related stuff. Uh, non-movie review related stuff. So, yeah. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Lucky Dog, Lucky Dog Podcast. I can't talk right now. <laughs> Alright everyone, take it easy. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Lucky Dog Podcast. This is your host, Elias Roush. This podcast is sponsored by EliasRoushMedia.com, photo, video, digital media production. Today we are discussing Season 1, Episode 4 of The Outsider. This episode is named Ken Vin El Coco. I apologize if I got that wrong, but... That's how I'm going to have to roll with it at this moment until I get corrected. This was directed by Andrew Bernstein, and it's written by Richard Price, based on the novel by Stephen King. I don't know if I mentioned it last episode, but the last episode was also written uh, and directed by the same crew. It's somewhat of a transition from the Jason Bateman style of directing, but I can still tell that they're taking up very much of the same cinematography, same language, same uh, same atmosphere. Episode 4. While retracing the Maitland's recent family vacation, Holly pursues a possible connection to an eerily similar case and gains valuable insight from the local former de detective, Andy Casavage. Glory faces increased scrutiny in her daily life. So this was an interesting episode. It still continues on this very much uh, police procedural from a different perspective. The first two episodes were so very much Ralph-centric and Terry Maitland-centric that I'm liking this divergence in uh, perspective telling of the case following uh, Cynthia Erivo's character, Holly. 
it definitely leads for much more broader storytelling, especially in the ways that Ralph is uh, dealing with the case versus how uh, Holly is dealing with the case. At the beginning, she gets pepper sprayed by the lady that she was trying to talk to at uh, the living facility. I want to correct myself that the guy that was in jail was accused of killing two girls. He was working at the nursing home that Terry Maitland's father was staying at. In this episode, we really figure out that there's a there's a commonality between all of the murders. The initial murder happens. And then we find we find out that there is a, str- a string of people that have come in contact with this murderer that have also committed other murders. And so there happens to be this young lady that was in contact with the nursing guy. Um... Let me see. Uh, the nursing home guy. And then the nursing home guy was uh, had bumped into Terry. And all of them have scratched each other in some sort of way. Like an odd like way when they're bumping into each other. As well as Terry bumping into the strip club guy. So, should we look out for the strip club guy? Possibly being the uh, uh, one of these shapeshifters or whatever this murder virus is or whatever this is supposed to be also we got the boogeyman name check i just want to say that i did not see this episode before saying the boogeyman in episode three so i was very pleased to see that so at the beginning she gets pepper sprayed by uh that uh one worker Find out about the uh, nursing guy bumping into Terry that day. There's a reporter that tries to apply for the babysitting job that of the Maitland's home, which I did not see coming, and I uh, I really liked the small test uh, she was giving her, like uh, addition and divisional problems, just off the cuff. If you're a teacher, then you'll be able to do it. Um, we also find out how the public is uh, treating Miss Maitland and the family. I mean, like, why would you even give shit to this woman? I, I would have zero tolerance for someone that is uh, yelling at someone or, you know, giving somebody grief after while they're grieving. Like, that is just, it's ridiculous. It, it, it kind of reminds me, unfortunately, of the Kobe Bryant situation stuff going on. It's like, please just let the, you know... The, the dead rest. Hmm. Cynthia's conversation with uh, Terry Maitland's father is pretty random. Um, the majority of stuff, he's just like, oh yeah, I've seen you before. He gave you a good smack and he's talking about like some lady that he saw abused. I was like, what is he talking about? Just rambling. And basically, Mr. Senior Maitland was saying he didn't do it. And you know he didn't do it. It makes you think that he might be just a tad bit there, despite him losing his memory. So we... I need to go back to see the first episode, but did... uh, I'm trying to remember if the club guy said that he got scratched by Terry when he was giving him a, a shake or something like that. I don't, I don't remember that exactly. I need to go back and check uh, episode one one more time for it. So, Detective Asshole, buying a bunch of lights and shooting a deer, is this for the boogeyman thing? Or who, what the hell's going on over there? Is he going camping? Is he starting his own little Walmart for homeless people outside? Like, what is going on over there? Like, I... Trying to figure out what, what the hell's going on. Um, the mall cop, we find out, that goes out with Cynthia Revo is an ex-detective. De- and he did have a thing for her. And I think they were kind of cute. It ends up that he happens to know 
a little bit of Lithuanian or something like that. I, I don't remember if he explained why he knew that, but of course, they sort of hit it off. Um, they go on a date, talk about uh, previous uh, you know murders and stuff like that, just craziness. Um, we find out her mother died. And, uh, what else? The brother of the nurse killed himself, too. Yeah, oh, yeah, sorry, the brother OD'd. Sorry, the nurse that worked at the Maitland's, uh, establishment, uh, the, the Maitland's, uh, uh, retirement establishment, the brother OD'd, and then we find out the mother killed herself in a car wreck, and so we find out that Essentially, whatever this is, this entity is causing people to, one, get devoured, and then the people around them are just self-destructing in some sort of way. And it's very similar to what happened to the Petersons and uh, the the original murder and, and sort of what's happening to the Maitlands. It's, it's like a domino effect, which makes me wonder, what the hell is the club owner going to do? Like, is he... Is him and... Uh, you know, detective, deputy, asshole, is, are they going to be doing something together? Like, I'm, I'm curious what the, what the deal is. And, uh, I keep calling him detective asshole. I think his name is Jack or something, but, you know, that's just, it's too easy not to. Uh, and actually, that actor, Mark, uh, Menchaca, playing Jack Hoskins, detective asshole is what I'm calling him, uh, but Mark Menchaca was actually an excellent actor on... He has been excellent on this, but he's even just as good as uh, he was on this on Ozark, again, with Jason Bateman. So, uh, what else do we have? Um, yeah, the club owner, got to keep an eye on him. There's an excellent... <clears throat> Excuse me. There's an excellent uh, scene of young Holly, I think, in the MRI machine, and she's kind of scared and whatnot, and she turns to her side, and uh, we are the perspective of her grandmother, and her grandmother hands her a small doll, and she's having all of this as a flashback in the back of a, a, a taxi, I believe, on the way to see... Uh, that lady in jail or, or in that establishment, uh, the asylum or wherever she was. But can have are we confirming that Cynthia Revo has some sort of connection? I'm not sure if I wasn't going to say connection to the dead, but she has connections to another side. She can like t teleport, transport stuff like that's pretty cool. And I love the uh, effect it was. I, I love the effect they used. It's very practical. Just having her grandmother's hand kind of reach out around her and, uh, you know, hold her face. Um, let's see. Cynthia Revo's character also ends up getting a note from another lady that is in the uh, jail cell. Um, and we also see that there's other ladies in that jail trying to uh, attack the one she's currently interviewing. Um, but one of the other ladies that was not in jail gives passes her a note, tells her to, I guess, come up to her apartment and have a conversation. And she tells her uh, about El Gordillo or El, El Cuco or, or something like that, uh, a.k.a. the Boogeyman or whatever this is. And it seems like it's some sort of mythological creature, idea, or figure that is eating the child or the children and then devours the grief uh, on the family. And so that's kind of a pretty big deal. And I'm like, oh shit, I, you know, how are you going to lock up the boogeyman? And what does that have to do with Detective Deputy Asshole? Like, I've got a lot of questions. So... Yeah, I'm 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 pretty pleased with the way this uh season's going. I do want to just start 5 and then just 
plow through it, but we still have uh, another month before all of it's going to be dropped. So, looks like it's going to be hitting that week to week. You already know what it is. So, check back in for the next podcast of The Outsider. If you're interested in more reviews, check out uh, Luck- The Lucky Doll Podcast, uh, SoundCloud, Apple iTunes, Google Play, whatever, YouTube. Um, we have reviewed Ad Astra. We have checked out Bad Boys for Life, 1917, Hustlers, The Witcher, Top 10 Films of the Decade, Watchmen Season 1, Mr. Robot, You Season 2, Star Wars, The Force Awakens, and even The Last Jedi. Check out the Uncut Gems review. Tons of podcasts for you to check out. I think close to 300 plus. I don't know, something around there. All right, well, thank you all for listening. Thank you for supporting, watching, listening, whatever you're doing, supporting the podcast. Five stars on iTunes really helps us out. Um, If you have a couple pennies or a couple of quarters or you're feeling generous or you just got paid and you're like, hey, son, have some of this. It's like, okay, we'll take just a little something, 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 you know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> um, PayPal.me slash the, the Lucky Doll Podcast. The link is in the description. Thank you all for supporting the Lucky Doll Podcast. We cannot do this without you. Thank you and take it easy. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Lucky Doll Podcast. This is your host, Elias Roush. This podcast is sponsored by EliasRoushMedia.com, photo, video, digital media production. Today we're discussing Season 1, Episode 10, Season Finale of The Outsider. This episode is directed by Andrew Bernstein, uh, written by Stephen King, based on the novel. And uh, we have Richard Price returning on the screenplay as well so one thing i've noticed over the past couple episodes you'll notice that we haven't had a a review since about episode four i believe i'd say the first half of this season was a lot stronger in my opinion um it was the introduction the first two episodes were the setup of the Terry Maitland story, but it's really Cynthia Erivo as Holly Gibney. This is her story. This really is episodes two through ten were pretty much uh, majority her story. And granted, I don't think. Oh, sorry, I said two through ten. I think I don't even think she comes into like the third episode. Um, but she is one of the most fascinating characters on screen. And just like the rest of the gang, I would say the, the majority of the cast did a knockout standout job. Now, that's like saying, you know, a, you know, a, a good actor did an amazing job. Well, these are all uh, sorry. A veteran actor did a good job. It's like, well, you expect you expect a veteran actor, veteran actor to do a good job. So, um, you know, Ben Mendelsohn, Cynthia Erivo, Bill Camp. Uh, even Jeremy Bob, character actors like Jeremy Bob, I mean, they play such naturalistic characters, it feels almost effortless for them to be in this, which makes it a little bit more difficult for me to say that I had slightly more gripes with this finale than I was hoping. I'd say 90% of the entire series um, I'm going to do talk talk about all of this series and spoilers of uh, this episode as well. So if you haven't seen it, uh, please go back and uh, either watch it or um, get refreshed in some way. And by the way, uh, there is a post-credit scene after the credits. So be sure to go back and check that. Originally when I was watching it, I did not see the credit scene and I had a podcast say, uh, give me the heads up. So I wanted to do the same for everybody else. Um, so this episode, well, let me do a, a quick summary of the season. A summary of the season is this is an amazing looking, uh, an amazing looking uh, piece of television. Uh, the cinematography and the use of a shallow depth of field are very notable. I think 
the writing started to become a little sloppy around episodes four or five. As a matter of fact, I went back and looked. We lost Richard Price after uh, episode four. So to break it down, Richard Price, the creator of um, of The Night Of, and he's also a writer on uh, The Deuce and The Wire, uh, among other things, um, and like I said, The Night Of, one of the better HBO television shows with Bill Camp in it as well. Richard Price created the first and wrote the first four episodes of this series. And then he came back for the last like one or two episodes. I, I believe he might be credited on some of the final episodes. Um, but there are additional writers that came in and helped him around five, six, seven, eight. And I... For me personally, I still think it looks, you know, like a million bucks. This is one of the better looking uh, crime drama shows that I can tell was done on a, a moderately lower budget. I, I really could tell that this was using, a, you know, really amazing shallow depth of field and cinema, uh, a, you know, a spicy cinematography. But this was done on a lower budget than what most HBO shows are produced for. Um Let's talk about the synopsis real quick. The group finds itself in a climactic showdown in their last ditch, desperate attempt to root out El Cuco. Now, I think it's around the first two episodes are the story of Terry Maitland. The episodes three through five are Holly figuring out who and what El Cuco is. And then episodes six, seven, eight are um, are are one of our characters, Jack Hoskins. Um, basically, uh, I don't know, over overseeing what's going on and trying to interfere, or El Cuco is trying to interfere with the uh, with the crimes that are going on and with the case that is trying to be solved, and so. I definitely feel like there's this really big, it, it's definitely a slow burn for the majority of the season, but it also left these little breadcrumbs that made you really want to watch the next episode. And so it's like, oh, it's about to be good. Oh, it's about to be good. Oh, it's about to be good. And then something would happen. Like it would, it would cut to the screen or it would cut to black or something. Something would happen. And so I felt like this kind of left us hanging in a little bit in a couple areas. Or body sack, or you know. Well, uh, give me your two seconds <laughs> of what you thought about The Outsider. Season one? Is there going to be a season two? I, I think they set it. They definitely set it up for it. Because I loved it. Oh, you loved it? I loved it. Oh, okay. I did. Um, what do you think about this uh, ending? I think the ending tells me there has to be a season two. I think they definitely set it up to have a season two if they wanted to. Um, my question is, how do you feel about them wrapping up all of the plot lines? You got the lawyer, you got was, Andy, think, you got the I think cops. At, at the end, I got a little confused about how they were going to convince everyone that Terry didn't do it. Mm -hmm. Did they? Or is it like a... I think they convinced everyone. But how? I'm not sure if I... If I enjoyed the fact that they decided to bury it, quote unquote. Yeah. I'm not sure how I feel about Th that. That's what I thought last night. I kept thinking like, okay, so what next? Like what? I wanted there to be slightly more uh, of a connection with uh, Ben Mendelsohn and him losing his son and the connection to El Cuco. And I felt like there was no connection. Even though Wasn't he, there one? Didn't he like change? He try. I think he tries to change into his son, but he. Ben Mendelsohn sees. Uh, what's his character name? Um. I honestly don't remember anyone's name except for Holly. <laughs> yeah, I just feel like someone. Everyone was yelling Holly at some point. I feel like she Ralph. Was, his I feel like Ralph. she was the most captivating character. Yeah, yeah. For me. Yeah. Uh, what I basically boiled it down to was the first two episodes are like the prequel to the eight episode story that is Holly's because mm -hmm. this movie this this sorry this miniseries was Holly's mm -hmm. 
Um, I had minor gripes with, I thought it was dumb decisions that these characters were making in these last, this last two episodes. Yeah. So we lost Andy trying to, I got to get some bars, man. I got to get some bars. And so he jumps in the middle of gunfire of a sniper. He doesn't know. At that point, they don't know that he's out there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, he knows he sh- they're shooting because what's oh, his name's already lost, out. blown yeah. his head off. You're right, and he gets out to. He's like, I gotta get some bars. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, Hold on. So which one was Andy? Andy was uh, her boyfriend or her mate. Oh my um, I didn't want him to die. I kind of. I didn't, I didn't want Ralph to die. I really didn't care about the lawyer. I didn't care about Alec, Claude, Clyde, and his brother. Yeah. Um, I wanted Holly, the guy that she and, liked, Andy, Andy, and Ralph to make it out. So I knew. I think everyone thought Andy was going to get blown up to smithereens after uh, they had their little. Episode nine cuddle sesh, you know, kissing and and you know, that's my girl kind of stuff. Um, it was too cute for them to let him live. So Dang, why is that a thing? It's just a trope, you know. Dang it. Uh, let me see. What else do we have? I thought it was unclear in certain cases whether Andy was dead or whether Howard was dead, which was uh, the lawyer. You remember I kept asking, I was like, is Howard dead? Is Howard dead? Because it never... So, when Andy shot, the camera pulls to the side and almost makes it seem like he has at least 10 seconds to get out of the car. Mm-hmm. And it made it feel like he wasn't immediately dead. Well, he wasn't. Well, we don't know that. I, I don't feel like it should... But that's why the lawyer ran to get him out of the car. Yeah, but I, it felt like Andy needed just... Uh, they should have given the one shot to Andy trying to escape the car or something like that, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-uh. Oh, that that was just me because I felt like the when I was listening to podcasts again and I was listening to how the people were dying, that was the, a big gripe of mine. It they would shoot or seemingly almost kill somebody or what it seemed like to kill somebody. Andy, for this example, the camera would pull away, or like with the lawyer when he was going up to pull Andy out of the car, which clearly this is when Andy dies, mm-hmm. but it blows up and. Mm-hmm the lawyer flies back and i've seen movies where people fly back and they live every time yeah but this was trying to be a little bit more grounded um i felt like it was a little bit sloppy with showing the snake maybe that i i know this is based off a book and maybe the snake is in the book yeah and holly had some sort of premonition that the snake was going to get him um, she was like, stop, you're wasting your bullets because the snake's got him. And the snake technically didn't get him. And it, I thought it was just unclear. Like, I, It looked like the snake was coming up to him to bite him, you know, without him knowing. But he turns to the snake and he's like, ready for it. Like, would you let a snake, if you're going to get bit by a snake, would you let it bite your face? He wanted to die. <laughs> I know, but it's like, let bite your arm. Bite you some, you don't have to like no, bite your bite face. His face. Why was his face? It was, his face was that was just his body's reaction to the venom. Oh, okay. Everything was messed up. His leg, his arm was swollen. His hands were swollen. His face was swollen. Sir. Yeah, <laughs> everything. No, I thought he got bit on the face because like he just like stored and he walks down there, and he's like, "Go, go kill that fucker" or something like that, mm-hmm. and blows his he's head. Like up. he's in there. Go kill him. And did I not call that his head? was yeah. going to explode in he some did. sort of fashion. You were like, his head looks like his head's going to explode. And this was before he was going to have the gun in his mouth. Like, I yeah. I didn't know what was going to happen. I was like... It literally just looked like <laughs> his head was a balloon and it was going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> it just looked like it needed to pop. Yeah. And they just... They, they had to fuck uh, Mark Menchaca's face up for well, the entire that's season. that's what all snake bites look like. Like, they need to be pumped. I mean, I just feel bad for this guy that ha- looks like he got the shit, like, railed out of him for the entire season. Yeah. Even mm. before El Cuco attached to him, he was like, shit. <laughs> yeah, he was getting his ass whooped by his ghost mom. Uh, but, um... So... A couple more sloppy things I thought the final episode kind of stumbled over it shows two ghostly images of these boys that are just appear in the cave when they're about who to... were those boys exactly so i didn't even think about it at the time one of the boys i think is ralph's son mm-hmm. and 
there and the other one was um the boy that he shot in the second episode that that killed terry no or was it the first boy that that they thought terry killed because remember we never saw that kid either did we that kid was very young we saw flashbacks of him and i think that this boy was too big this boy was too old my thing <clears throat> but why would the vision <clears throat> why would me. the visions of them two make him go back and do what he did i felt like it was not clear about what the visions meant yeah um, it wasn't I know, I, I like mean, not they, for me. it meant that he was still going to haunt him or something like that or that it meant that el cuco was still alive mm-hmm. <clears throat> i um the more, how- I th- the more i think about it the deaths within the whole series were pissing me or they didn't piss me off they were agitating. Remember when we thought Terry was going to die? Or mm-hmm. we didn't know he was dead? And he's just casually dead. It was just unclear. Yeah. And that's what seemed to happen throughout the entire season for me. Yeah. I'm trying I to don't think. know. I felt like I knew Terry was dead. I felt like it was just like, you know, we're sorry for the loss of your husband or something. And, yeah. and that was it. I was like, wait, what? And we never saw the body. We, you know. Yeah. Um, I feel like... I don't understand why the boy that he shot... Well, I do. You know how, like, when El Cuco's face was shifting? Mm -hmm. And was it when it got to his son's face that he finally bashed it with the rock? Because, you know... I couldn't tell who's... uh, Excuse me. He had that vision of his son saying, you have to let me go. I I don't know who cuckoo turned into at the very end it looked like he was trying to but he transformed to like 10 different faces well he trans he he, it showed you the faces of everyone that he killed okay yeah like the black guy the two girls um not the two girls the uh the girl that scratched holly all the people that he had he had attacked I think so. Or all the people he had, like, scratched or, like, attached to. Mm, okay. And the yes. people with the shit on their neck. Yeah. They got a big <laughs> neck. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So, yeah. I thought the initial killing of Kuko, or well, just the entering of the cave and everything like that, the cave for me felt cheap. Something I about... I like the caves. <clears throat> I thought they looked great. I, uh, I felt like... <clears throat> I need a fucking water or something jesus get some water oh i think i got a big one over here pause it okay i think i'm better sorry Mm -hmm. i was dying so uh what were we saying so the initial the all of the cave it just was a little bit irritating for me um i thought every time someone was uh even in episode nine when they show that family getting trapped in there Mm -hmm. i thought it looked cheap when they're yelling and then the rocks supposedly fall, it looked too. It, it looked cheap to me. See, I thought the, I thought the cave scenes were good. I thought the acting seemed cliche. I thought it did feel a little bit not. I don't want to say cliche, not not with the family, but in episode ten, I felt like it just wasn't natural. I wanted I wanted more resolution between all of the. I don't understand the point in the story of the family that got stuck in that cave. Well, that was Clyde and his brothers. Like one set, like family. one person out of that whole group of thirty-something people that got stuck in that cave was their family. One person. They said four. Oh, okay. So four people out of thirty-two. Thirty-two. Well, it's some sort of connection. I, I don't. Be, like, I, who was he mad at? Who was like? What was the point? Because he told the story. And he said he mentioned something about he took four of my kin. So what are you? Who are you pissed off? Who's he? Or I guess they? I, I guess he's talking about Cuco. I don't know if that's who they're referring to. I mean, we we never seen Cuco in that cave <clears throat> during that during that time frame during that story. Yeah, I I think that they're trying to imply that Cuco was in there or something like that. I don't. It, know. But it, it never did show it. it never they did. it never showed Cuco in that timeline. They could have done something better with that kind of, with that story because if I understand they had because everyone else who knew about all the caves in that little town or whatever were like there's no bear cave and he just so happened like yes there is and this is how I know oh yeah yeah I hate and, he's like I know y'all want to know how I and know it's like we know we that I um, know that we know like, that I know <laughs> 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 it was like um. All right, man, you want to spit this out because there's, like, a time frame. Because, but what's irritating with me, or what irritates me, is 
mm, Kuko was not part of that story. Well, the way the, the reason they were doing that is because they wanted to to sh- you know shift the viewer. They wanted to kind of trick the viewer because they wanted to make it look like the kids were going to run into El Cuco, mm-hmm. but we didn't know that El Cuco wasn't. E- they, they we didn't even know those were two separate timelines until like midway. So through we that just episode. needed that story. It was just you know to, you know a red herring. You know, it's just one of those things that make you think that's what was going to happen. Gotcha. Uh, it might might have been nice to see that Cuco was resting up in that uh cave when did they even set up that cave the the cave had been there since like the 40s i think they said i know but there was like literally like a cot with a blanket and like a lamp oh i did you miss episode three and four no oh okay well there's an episode where uh uh you know fucked up guy with the neck which one was his name jack Mm -hmm. I, i think his name's jack yeah um He's running around like Ikea or something like that, buying a bunch of lamps and a bunch of, like, home supplies oh. and taking it to the forest. Um, I think that's episodes, like, three or four when there, he's But, so how, what are you plugging the lamp up to? I don't know what he, <laughs> I don't, maybe a generator or some sort? I didn't, I don't know. Okay. There, when you start getting into the logistics of why does the devil thing even need a lamp and... Does he even need to sleep? Like, what does... I don't know. They When you get down that rabbit hole, it makes things a little bit too difficult. It's like... I didn't like the reason that he said that he chose kids was for the flavor. The I wanted... Sweeter. Yeah, I was like... That's something um, it would say. Yeah. I mean... I wanted something more psychological. My thing is, is you're sitting here freaking out like I need to eat. Well, you know, adults have... Like, would probably sustain you a little better. <laughs> Like adults, like, you know, 20 year olds. A big old juicy booty. Is that what you're Yeah. Asking? Like, a, you know, a, a big old. A plump 24 year old. Fat ass. Like a yeah. volleyball player that's been playing like, for a while. Like a, just a Thick voluptuous ass. woman who, like, oh, has been eat, eating clean her entire life would probably sustain you a little bit better because when you eat a shit ton of sugar, you don't hold on to that. So that's why he's always hungry. <laughs> he's always eating kids. Because <laughs> the kids are just full of sugar. He said they're sweet. Oh, well, it makes sense because, I mean, kids eat like 90% sugar. Yeah. So that's why he's always hungry. All right. Well, <laughs> um, let's talk about this final. For anyone who wanted to look at it from a medical standpoint. <laughs> All right. Last, last two things. We're going to talk about uh, the final scene with Holly and the scratch but before then i want to talk about the the women of the show that they seem to have a lot of time uh when not not holly sorry i'm talking about the mothers i don't like that his wife wasn't a part of them finding cuckoo i do feel like it was kind of a drop ball that they have her interact with cuckoo and not go on yeah. some sort of excursion i don't yeah. know what i I don't think I would have wanted her out there in the middle of gunfire, but maybe have Mm-mm. her stay at the hotel and maybe look out. I, f- I feel like they were just left out of the mix. Stay at the house, and then if we're not back by tomorrow morning, come look for us. Well, she was at the house. No, no, no. The house in Tennessee where they were. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, d- I just thought that Terry's wife maybe deserved a little bit more of an explanation yeah and she did say to her i think don't talk about cuckoos don't talk about you know what what actually happened because i think terry's wife had to cover it up as well hmm cover what up cover up the fact that there's a cuckoo why i didn't catch that i didn't catch that part well immediately after the the thing uh, she and Terry's wife, I believe, are having a conversation about don't talk about cuckoos, don't talk about any of that, and they have some sort of resolute ending. I, I remember the resolute ending, but I don't remember her saying don't talk about it. I remember her saying like, you know, even if I don't believe in it, or even if I don't want to talk about it or believe in it, right. I respect your beliefs, or I expect what you know. You, th- I don't know. Right, and and that's what I, I just feel like for the, f- I don't know, I feel like they were coming together to, to really resolve something, and I feel like we were left dangling. Yeah. This whole, there, that's not in here. What? The scene you're looking for with the, 
That's not in here. Yeah, it is. No, it's not. Don't talk about a cuckoo. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Okay, well then I missed a lot more than you showed me. Well, this is just the very end when when the ladies. Yeah, I didn't see this. All right. Well, the uh, the conversation I'm thinking of is when Terry's wife shows up at Ralph's door, and when the door opens, she goes, "I should have called." <laughs> <laughs> I should have. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I haven't seen any of this. I didn't see this stuff. Oh uh, well, it, it's just them like uh, talking about what didn't actually happen. Damn it! I fell asleep. <laughs> yeah, but. You really didn't miss much. They just essentially don't tell anybody about the cuckoo. Why? Because they don't... Well, it's They find that it's going to be too hard to explain. Oh, see, I wanted this to be... I wanted this to end with all these people having... Either not getting justification or coming to grasps with this thing is real. That's what I wanted. Either you can believe in it and grasp it, or you can sit with your thoughts and not want to believe it, and oh well. I mean, that's... Essentially, that's sort of what they did. The thing is, they didn't publicize it. Yeah. And so... If I was Terry's wife, I wouldn't give a dang what anyone found out or didn't find out. I would be like, hey, um, so since you know something... You need to get all of this stuff about my husband killing a child, like, out of sight. Yeah, yeah they, they did. They did? Yeah. Oh. And and that's what the uh, the final scene with Holly is looking at, um, an article of oh, okay. Terry and everything. I, I think he's exonerated in, in from that. Oh, okay. And uh, I think the district attorney or whatever, the guy of the Justice Department, mm -hmm. um... He's part of that squad, too. I just very much feel like the Terry aspect. Of, I, I think my ultimate grasp is that Terry feels like a forgotten plot line. It doesn't feel connected for me to Kuko enough because yeah. Kuko has gone through so many other families. Well, Kuko killed a lot of those families and he didn't kill Terry. A gunshot killed Terry. He just witnessed it. I mean, Cuckoo was there when he died, but I wonder if Cuckoo the, didn't kill him. I wonder if Cuckoo caused the son to kill him. Mm -mm. That kid killed Terry because of grief of his mom. But we know that Cuckoo was there. We know Cuckoo was there, but Cuckoo at no point did we see Cuckoo uh, have any kind of contact or like Control. entity over that kid. Yeah, I'm just saying there's a possibility. And this and this is when they're talking about exonerating um, Terry. And so, I just, I, <laughs> I don't know. I feel like there's so many other cases that we had to go through to find out the resolution to Terry's case that Terry's almost feels like a second thought or a last thought. Um, you know, we're because we're. I don't even feel like I saw a picture of Jason Bateman in the last three episodes besides the last scene. Mm -hmm. And there's actually an, uh, a scene between Ralph and Holly, and she's like, I'm, this might have been when you fell asleep. She's like, you know, how did you, I don't remember he says, you know, how did you know what it was or something like that? And she's like, because... I'm an outsider. And he's an outsider. Who said this? Um, Holly said this to mm -hmm. Ralph. And he, uh, Ralph is like, well, are there any more of them out there? Mm -hmm. And Holly gives this, like, shrug mm -hmm. and walks out of his house. Yeah. And so that's how they kind of leave that. One thing, I don't feel like they established Holly an, as a antisocial individual. Mm -hmm. She's definitely weird and she's definitely got these weird proclivities. She's not antisocial though. Yeah, I didn't feel like she's antisocial. I mean she had mm -hmm. Andy and yeah. and she's very much inducted in the gang. It's not like she just needed alone time. Yeah. Um and she had some pretty traumatizing upbringing. Um things happened to her. 
So, um, yeah, I think my biggest critique is that the, the Maitland family feels kind of like an afterthought. Mm-hmm. It doesn't feel 100% connected to the plot line of Cuckoo. Yeah, no. I don't think so either. And, uh, you know, that's... It, it's not a, a, a in a way that it takes me out of the 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 enjoyment of the... I keep saying... I keep thinking of the movie, the miniseries. Yeah. Um... But yeah, what else do we got? Holly, she scratched. When the hell did she never came in contact with Cuco? So, is that scratch? Uh, that scratch is. Well, I mean, I guess it could have been from the rocks. Everyone I've heard is saying the rocks, or well, she's then Cuco. she wouldn't. If the if a rock scratched her, then she wouldn't have. She wouldn't be turning into anything. Um, yeah, I mean, the rock isn't going to do anything. But the thing is, uh, oh, this is when she's talking about a man knows a man. Oh, oh, an outsider knows an outsider. That's what she says. Um, yeah, so two things. One, if she is scratched, is El Cuco dead? Because she's having flashes of jack in her bathroom Mm -hmm. and you don't want flashes of jack in your bathroom no (laughs) um but i mean before all this stuff with cuckoo even happened before she came in contact with cuckoo jack was trying to kill her right she's just got a little bit of ptsd that would make sense i would probably see him jack too Mm -hmm. but also um she was also having contact with people that had passed on I think her grandmother, she saw her in one of the episodes. Mm -hmm. See, I don't get that she's given like a sneaky, like, I'm, I'm Cuckoo shrug. That looked to me like a... A genuine. Like a genuine, I'm glad you're asking, I'm glad you're opening your mind kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Is what I got from that. I did too. If there's, if there's no, uh, uh, you know, ending scene, what is it called? Mid-credit scene? Mm Mm-hmm. Then I would have said, yeah, she's not. She never got scratched. Nothing ever happened. It's just they added that at the very end. Um, You know, and it doesn't bother me. He also had a scratch on his face, though. Ralph, just now. Yeah. That's got to be, no. The scratch on her arm's got to be from the rocks. Because El Cuco never touched, he never got close enough to touch her. That's what I was thinking. They never got in contact. Because he shot her. I mean, he shot him. No, no, no. What? El Cuco never got in contact, but... Clyde did. He shot him. He didn't touch him. But Clyde was being helped out by Holly. Okay. And we know Cuckoo is still alive. What are you talking about? In the cave. No, the person who is Cuckoo has to scratch you. Not the person who they... Like... They think is Cuckoo. No, the person who is... Yeah. Cuckoo has to scratch you or the or uh the, so the, the real person has the, to scratch you? Cuckoo. Okay, okay. Not the person that he turned into. Cuz I'm trying to think if Cuckoo was the one in the strip club that sh- that scratched That was Cuckoo. Okay, so that was Cuckoo. Mhm. And Cuz Terry was somewhere. The real Terry was somewhere else. Yeah. So the Cuckoo or So Cuckoo has to scratch you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I I it would bug me to see that Holly is um, evil. Yeah. Which turn? Yeah, it would me too. Or not evil, but you know, just under the possession of it, because um, she looks to see if she has the the thing on her neck, and she doesn't. So that's good to see. Anything else you want to add to this podcast? I did see that that last scene of her twirling her hair is uh, shown in reverse. I know some people. I thought that. Yeah. It I thought weird. so for a second. I was like, that just went backwards. Yeah. I, I I didn't notice it originally watching it. It was a podcast that pointed it out. So. It does. Looks like it goes in reverse. Well, her hair is like dropped and it goes back in her hand or something. Something like at, that. At one point. So. Do, I thought I thought I seen it, but then I was like, maybe I didn't. But yeah, yeah I, I definitely thought her hair... The twirling went in reverse for a second? Yeah, it definitely did. Why would they do that? Sometimes it's, uh, shots are done in reverse and you gotta just have a keen eye to do that. Otherwise, something funky's going on. 
Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. We've covered season one of uh, The Outsider. I definitely want to check out a season two if we get some of these uh, fine actors back. Yeah, especially Holly. Yeah. We have to have Holly. Bring me some more Holly. 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 All right. Check out the social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, PayPal, dot me slash the Luggedout Podcast, the Luggedout Podcast for uh, all donations. Links are down below. Uh, Kelly, thank you for joining me or just jumping on in. Thanks for having me. All right, everybody. For more Look It Out Podcast, you know, check out SoundCloud, Look It Out Podcast, and take it easy.